everyone. My name is Austin Belzer and welcome back to another one of my interviews. Today I'll be discussing the 2023 edition of the Tallgrass Film Festival, which, and let me know if I've got this wrong, Melanie. It takes place both physically in Wichita, Kansas, and virtually through Eventive, October 5th through October 8th. You got um, it all right. <laughs> okay. I, I looked it up beforehand just to make sure. And my guest is Melanie Lynn Addington, who, if you don't know, is the executive director of the festival. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Also correct. You've done your research. <laughs> okay. But yeah, let's get to talking about the Tallgrass Film Festival, which, by the way, thank you for inviting me to cover it in just this crazy time that is like the end of uh, the start of fall film festivals. Yeah. But yeah, with that, let's see. Just give us like a quick overview of the films that are playing at uh, Tallgrass. Yeah. So we have a little over 184 films selected from about 1600 submissions from around the world. And we have things that were made locally here in Wichita, Kansas, all the way to things made pretty much anywhere, any country you can think of. And we do a wide variety. So we try and make sure there's something for everyone. So we obviously have documentary features and we have documentary shorts and those cover a wide range of subjects, anything from mental health to, oh, I can't think of another one. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of mental health this year. And then we have narrative. And then within that, we have horror, we have comedy, we have a little bit of everything. And then we do what we call vortex, which is our animation and experimental category. Um, uh, Wichita Vortex Sutra. And so Vortex is a name we claim affectionately here in Wichita. Okay, I was wondering about that because in my mind, when I was looking at Eventive, because I'll be covering virtually, I was like, is that their version of Sundance next? <laughs> it It's really, no, um, I do love Sundance next, um, but it is really something I adopted from my old festival in Oxford, Mississippi, Oxford Film Festival. Uh, we also had a, a uh, hybrid animation and experimental category because really it's people working outside of the traditional model of film and it a lot of things cross over and so it's really nice to be able to show both and some are definitely lean a little bit more experimental and some lean definitely a little more just traditional animation but there's a lot of in between in there. Yeah and I guess speaking about theming that actually rolls into my next question beautifully as if you planned it or something but I talked with Thomas Stoneham Judge from For Real. In fact, the podcast episode's now out for TIFF. And I asked him what the theme of TIFF was. And I want to repeat that same question, but for Tallgrass. Yeah. So we always have the same theme every year, pretty much since the beginning, stubbornly independent. We really lean into that. We try not to have a lot of studio films. In fact, I don't think we have a single one. We have one short that's been bought by HBO this year. That's it. Everything is very independent. And we do bring distributors in who then really do pick up films here, but we try and really not just do what everyone else is doing on the festival circuit and, and try and find those hidden gems that don't have the traditional support or the sales agent or the PR rep. And then of course, we also have some that are getting lots of PR like Chasing Amy, which is an amazing film. It's just, for us, it's always about being stubbornly independent. Yeah. And yeah, speaking of Chasing Amy, I'm probably going to try and see that. And yeah, I might try so and great. see uh, Your Fat Friend. Uh, I miss that. So Tribeca. good as well. Yeah. And I think Playland's showing here too. It is. Yeah, we have. And then also the Soda Jerk film, which is really fun. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name. That's terrible. <laughs> uh, Look, I get uh, it. Yeah, there's so many of them and we're in itinerary mode. So I remember their name, not their film at this point. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess with that, what would be your favorite selections of the program this year? Yeah, uh, I really, I have a wide variety that I like this year. I'm very excited, and the one I really fought to get it was the People's Joker, speaking of TIFF. Oh, nice. <laughs> Where it well premiered a while back. What an amazing, stubbornly independent journey that film has had, literally fighting up against the big guys and winning. So if people don't know about The People's Joker, it world premiered at TIFF, oh gosh, two years ago now, and yeah. Warner Brothers immediately got it shut down. And so they had an intellectual property lawsuit really for the past two years, and then finally actually won the battle, classic David versus Goliath. And so they've been able to start playing festivals. So they played Outfest. I think they're playing Fantastic Fest this week, and then they're playing us, and then they just keep going. 
And so Vera Drew, the filmmaker, is coming. I'm just really enthralled by her story. So I'm really happy to highlight that film. Yeah, and I guess on the uh, flip side, I'm always interested to see, because I know you talked about this right before we follow each other on social media. Yeah. And you before you announced the program, or Tall Grass, rather, you said there was like a few that you were fighting to get that you just couldn't get. So um, we did. Yeah, we had a couple that we did lose. And then we had a couple that are still coming, but like the stars can no longer come because while I'm very excited, the writer strike is now over. The SAG-AFTRA strike is not over. And we we're being very supportive of all of our union folks and making sure that we're doing things above the board. So any film we have and anyone who's attending, we've gotten cleared through SAG and really just trying to do the right thing while everyone's fighting for justice. Yeah. And I guess briefly touching on that, as we're recording this today, the writer's strike ended. Which is amazing. Yeah, that's just really cool. And I guess that already covers my question of if there's any considerations or shifts you're making at Tallgrass. I don't know what that we get a lot of producers at our festival which is lovely i love having producers here and a lot of them are sometimes producers writers or directors writers and so it does open up really on the stage just some more questions that we can focus in on story and process but in terms of who's attending i don't think we're suddenly having more screenwriters coming yeah and that makes sense because even when i was making the questions for this i was like might be too soon it is a little yeah we're always right on that cusp and but all the fall festivals have been very creative like shorts have been cleared so like we have filmmakers like barry corbin and jim beaver coming because they have a short so you could still have a little bit of celebrity status at your festival heartland has i think matthew modine coming because he's producing a documentary there's still ways around supporting film but see our festival's always been about filmmakers connecting with their audience and that's not changing because of the strikes. Yeah. And I think that's an important distinction to make because it's, I I think you have some festivals like South by Southwest where a lot of the focus is networking or just meeting people. Yeah. Um, And we do, we do that too, but obviously South by is massive. Your sales festivals They're there because distributors are looking to buy your film or you're having meetings. For us, it's really about filmmakers being celebrated and having fun. We literally have to tell them to go to bed and stop doing karaoke at 6 a.m. usually. (laughs) It's really more about the celebration of film here. Yeah, that that reminds me of um, what a lot of the feel around, I don't know if you're familiar, Slam Dance. Oh, I love Slam Dance. Yeah, me too. Ever since I got invited like three two, three years ago, something like that. Yeah. I actually just recommended two films. It was the Jerry, starring Jerry as himself and then another film from Tribeca, Our Son, uh, to oh, the yeah. director of Something You Said Last Night, mm-hmm. which go check out that interview. But yeah, something else we talked about, Thomas and I, on that latest TIFF podcast, we always want to hear a little bit from programmers. And I would... If you have any insights, like from the (laughs) festival programmers, is there anything the programmers would like us to know? Yeah, I always, and I actually try, I built an alliance here in Wichita and try and help filmmakers with this because it's so important. Two things, your ego will get you nowhere in this industry. You're going to get rejections because it's a numbers game. When there are a thousand other shorts in line for 25 spots, of course, a lot of good films get rejected. Ask for the feedback, network, maybe go to the festivals you really want to get into, meet the filmmakers that they're choosing, see the films they're choosing, really learn from the experience. Don't just take your first rejection slip and go, oh, that's it. I'm not a filmmaker. I'm so disheartened by filmmakers that don't realize sometimes the rejection is something that really hurts us to send out because we we cut some films that are like, oh, if we just had one more venue, (laughs) if we just had one more this. So a lot of good films get cut because there's just so much more access to film equipment, which I love. I love the democratization of the film industry, but it also means a lot more content. Oh, sorry. The bad C word. A lot more films to have to peruse and a lot more films to have to cut. So 
we also, my other big thing is if the filmmakers taking a risk and putting their heart into it, or if they're just following the numbers of what they think a good film that will get into a festival should be. In general, films, we have a, a one through 10 scale. Very rarely do we get nines and tens. Very rarely do we get ones. Most films just land in the middle. It was good enough. It was adequate. It was not memorable. And that is no fault of the filmmaker other than they're not putting that risk and they're not putting that heart into their story. Yeah, a term I like to use, and maybe this is the wrong term, is sometimes <laughs> I'll refer to something as aggressively fine. That's perfect. I love that term, aggressively um, fine. <laughs> but two th things that come to mind when you're talking about feedback were two interactions, one with a publicist recently and then one with the actual filmmaker. One with the filmmaker was for First Date, the Sundance film. Yeah. I had seen it when it generally released, uh, I think last year or the year before. Time is a contract. Um, I, I know. I feel like and, it's still just 2020 at this point. We should just all give up. It's 2020. <laughs> yeah. And when I sent out the review link, got Magnolia Pictures, but I think I was working some way with the director and he emailed me to personally thank me for uh, taking the time to review it. Um, That's great. Because, which was really great. And then all, the story on the publicist side was there's this film coming out that as a reality of being a reviewer, sometimes you can't get to everything, right. especially in a festival, which like you said 142. Yeah, like you can't get to everything. So I've had to send two separate emails to this guy saying, hey, I'm sorry, I really can't cover this again. So maybe w when it comes to VOD, we can coordinate something. Because especially with these smaller films, what I find is important to talk to publicists about is saying, hey, it's not personal. I just don't have the time. Yeah. Especially with the shoestring budget indies where they really need all the publicity they can get. Really, yeah. And festivals like this, I don't know how what the budgets are for these films, but a film like Playland is going to get a massive boost. Yeah, uh, our stubbornly independent category is any film under $750,000 budget. <clears throat> Anything else on the different categories can be any budget, but <clears throat> we really do try and keep it really similar to Film Independence Spirit Award budget number. I was going to ask about that because I, was, yeah. I kept... I was hearing you say stubbornly independent, and I'm like, are you unofficially the film independent uh, spirit festival? No, not at all. We have no correlation, other than I am a member and support them. <laughs> Same. Yeah. I, I voted for the last two, three years, something yeah. like that. They're great. Uh, They're doing great things. I love them. Yeah, I really hope. I'll, I'll be interested to see this year's slate, especially with the strikes and seeing how that affects things. Yeah, um, but there's been some really strong indie films in the spring circuit, so I'm really excited to see what gets celebrated. Yeah, I I just rented Past Lives. Oh, um, have you, you haven't seen it yet, have you? No. Oh, um, it's my favorite film this year so far. Absolutely. Mine's still a Michael J. Fox story. I do love that. I did see that back in January for Sundance, and that I actually reviewed that too, and I... It was really well done. I think, okay, I will say this is my favorite narrative of the year so far. <laughs> okay, I think, yeah, I think, what was my favorite narrative? I think it was John Wick, surprisingly. Okay, you have to see or past somewhere lives around first. there. You're going to have to see past lives before you you pass judgment of your favorite. <laughs> oh, oh, for sure. That I keep my 2020, the ranked list, private on Letterboxd until March of the next year. Yeah. I actually yeah. met a filmmaker that didn't know what Letterbox was the other day. And I was like, how? <laughs> it is literally what all I do. It's my entire personality. <laughs> so. Yeah. What are you doing if you didn't, don't spend <laughs> entire days writing down lists? It was funny. I keep referencing the previous podcast, but Thomas wanted to, to know what my favorite films were that premiered at Sundance were. So I mm. went from every, like, every film I've ever watched and put them in rank lists. Oh. And for every year that I've seen a movie in. Amazing. So I spent like an entire day this week, entire Monday, putting that list like back to 1900 something. Oh, amazing. Like 1930 or something. But anyways, 
go check out Letterbox if you want. Yeah. I'll probably have a. And you're not even sponsored by them. We're just talking about them loving. If they want to sponsor me, <laughs> yeah, maybe. If they want to sponsor me, I'll, I won't say no to money. I'll never say no to money. <laughs> For those who follow me, I just put out a thing. Hey, if, if anyone has the money, could they just donate a PS5 to me? <laughs> because I need to play Spider Man too. Yeah, it's important. It's important. <laughs> Priorities. But speaking of priorities, getting back into tall grass, yeah, I'd love to hear your suggestions both for physical and virtual uh, t- attendance of tall grass for maybe yes. first time people. Sure, first time people, especially if you are from out of state, there's less films available, but there are still films, which is great because you can see a lot of the stuff anywhere you are in the world, and. Chasing Chasing Amy is actually virtual for one week. And I think it's important to be seen. I I don't know. There's so many good ones. Playland is virtual. I love Your Fat Friends. I really love The Woman of Stars and Mountains, which is about uh, a woman from Mexico that ended up in Kansas and was put into a mental institution. And then they said that she didn't speak any language that anyone could understand and so they just kept her in there for almost 15 years and finally a woman volunteering really she just speaks spanish (laughs) it is the most bizarre true life documentary it is wild to me and then there's some really great ones that have already played other festivals like join or die but i think it's Mm -hmm. really great on my list actually i'm looking at it now It's wonderful. We're doing that conversation with Barry Corbin live in person, but then we're going to put it up virtually along with his short film, Trail End. So that'll be nice. Yeah, it just depends on what you want to do virtually. And then all of our shorts are available virtually. And really, there's some really solid work in there. A little known comedian, Ricky Gervais, has a short film. (laughs) So we're excited for that. And then in person, it's this why we have a grid. And my suggestion is always three plans. Yeah. Option A, what you really think you want to see. Option B is the, okay, if that doesn't work out and I didn't like it, I'll go see this. And then option C is, okay, I missed everything because I ended up talking to people in the VIP lounge for four hours. (laughs) So what do I catch online? And so it's really part of it is like having a plan, but also being able to let go of the plan while you're at a festival. It's just as good as life advice. You'd have to go with the flow, but also have some idea of what you're trying to go for but really the big thing with festivals for me always and I've I have been doing this for 20 years so I'm not a newbie but it's okay if you really aren't digging the film it's you don't have to go trash it but just walk out and try a different film and that's the joy of festivals that's all my advice yeah and I think that last bit is probably the best part because during Sundance 2021 there were a lot of films I just was not vibing with. Yeah, um, and that's okay. I think it's great, it, especially with virtual, you have time to be just like able to go through some things and find some yeah. gems that you wouldn't have discovered otherwise. Because sometimes a log line, you're like, I don't know, that doesn't look good. And then it's amazing. <laughs> so, Yeah, so I guess my tip, at least for just general festival, well, I've only gone to a few, but all virtual. So that's where my strengths lie. I would say... First, go look at the virtual schedule, look at the log line, and then if there's anything you're interested in, bookmark it. Put a bookmark folder, and then when it gets closer to the when you need to order it or get your pass or whatever, look at it again. And if that second time you look at it and like, I really want to see this. this is a really nice concept. Maybe it's got a really cool log line or just you think the image looks cool on inventive yeah. then just watch those and then go like just explore yeah that's why i'm we do a virtual pass that is literally only 50 dollars. all it does is cover the unlock fees but i want people to watch these films and appreciate them mm. and discover something new so it really yet yeah, it's a ridiculous value but we do pay what you can because we split the sales with our filmmakers And so some people will, instead of the $7 minimum, will give 20 bucks and then the filmmaker gets 10. So it's nice to help support our indie filmmakers. Yeah. And yeah, I I definitely think that's admirable because I I feel like, especially if we were like pre-strike or stuff like that, I think it just, it's, I feel like 
a lot of cast and crew don't get enough credit. Yeah, agreed. But yeah, <laughs> anything they can get is great. But yeah, let's see. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about regarding Tallgrass? Anything I missed out on? Because I, guess I probably we should, did. We should mention to people they can go to tallgrassfilm.org and buy their virtual pass or come to Wichita for a weekend. Yeah, uh, come to Wichita. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and also, having worked in Kansas movie theaters, there's a lot of AMCs out there. Maybe you catch a movie. Uh, yeah, we do have an AMC. Your, your... We also have what used to be the world's largest IMAX. A few more have been built since, but uh, yeah, and that's a Regal, which is great. Oh, is it not the Studio 28? No, that's in no, Olathe. That's in Olathe. Yeah, it used to be Warren Theaters, and then he sold to Regal. And so they have two, they used to have three, they shut one down recently, which was heartbreaking for everyone. And then AMC, and then we have a micro cinema. So we show all the stuff no one else will show like Memoria <laughs> and different things like that. Oh, when I tell you, I'm never going to see that movie. Yeah, because like, it's only in theaters, right? Yeah. And I'm like, Neon, what are you doing? Eventually, uh, they'll get tired of that shtick, I think. But it is. Yeah, it. It's so uncomfortable with an audience. And I think that is absolutely part of the point. But yeah, it would be nice for that film to be a little more accessible. And plus, it's not like, speaking on that uncomfortable with the audience thing, I feel like Neon's movies are those ones where you're like- That's their, wanna... their brand. Let's yeah. make you uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, okay, maybe let's watch this when it comes out on digital or Hulu. <laughs> um, and yeah. just- Shut all the blinds and everything. Be like, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes it's for... good if you can get out to be uncomfortable with other people sometimes. And if you can't, I think it's important, especially for this industry, to make sure that films are accessible to as wide an audience as possible. So, yeah. And especially living in an area, personally, for me, where that isn't an option, a lot of indie yeah. movies do not play here. Yeah. I, I don't know if you've ever been to the area, but we've got two theaters and that's it. Yeah. Uh, and they're run by the same guy. Could we get some A24 movies at least? Just I one? I know. Um, I, I know. It is so important for this film industry. And it has been for a long time. But the distributors haven't quite caught on. <laughs> so. Yeah. But with that said, I, I want to, I don't want to take some, any more of your time. Because I know <laughs> it's right. a, a busy time. It is a busy uh, time. But I appreciate you letting me just talk about movies for a few minutes. It's fun. Yeah, it's always nice to talk about movies all the time. But with that said, thank you all for watching or listening, however you did this. If you enjoyed this, if you're listening to this as a podcast, because I know people like listening to interviews as a podcast, please subscribe and leave rating and review wherever that applies. I know Spotify has it, Apple Podcasts. I don't know where else, but wherever that exists, subscribe <laughs> and leave a rating. All on the internet review. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you can follow me on social media at Austin B Media everywhere except X because they won't give me that handle. So I have to put an underscore at the end of it. So just remember that underscore. Then I just want to take some time to thank my patrons. I'm Beulah Beulah, Brian Scuttle, Joseph Davis, uh, whose work you can find on Sif Pop, Matthew Simpson of Awesome Friday, and Tom Blackburn, who gave me the idea to do this discussion style format. So if you would like to become a patron, Go to patreon.com slash austinbmedia or austinb.media slash support. Or I think you can also go to join.austinb.media to become a patron. And then if you like listening to this as an audio podcast, because I recently found out that if I upload this as a video episode, it doesn't, it won't play the audio. It'll just play the video. So if you like audio, you can connect your Patreon and Spotify accounts together to listen to these discussions 24 hours in advance of everyone else. Oh, so with that's that cool. said, yeah, that is really cool. I, <laughs> I When they announced it in March at the Spotify Stream On event, I was super stoked. And I'd also be interested to hear from my patrons, what do you think about the Spotify Patreon linking? Well, let me know in the comments of the Patreon post. But with that said, Melanie, I'll see you on the social networks. Um, oh, probably where, where right after. Find, 
where, where can people find you, by the way? Me, personally, I'm usually Mel Addington on everything. Instagram, threads, Facebook. And then on Tallgrass, we're just Tallgrass or Tallgrass Film everywhere. Awesome. I hope people check it out. Even if it's just like going into the eventive thing and watching a movie or two. Yeah. Um, I saw Flying Sailor, part of one of the shorts. So go maybe go check that out if you didn't see that when it was. It should have won. <laughs> I think it was in my uh, front runner. But with that said, thank you again, Melanie. I'll see you on uh, social media everywhere. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Mm-hmm.